Merry Christmas. This morning we will be lighting the Advent candle representing joy, the joy of our salvation. At Christmas we hear the word joy used more than any other time of the year. The same is true, of course, for the word Merry, as in Merry Christmas. If we were to, co to conduct a sort of man-on-the-street type uh, survey and ask the question, is there a difference between being merry and being joyful, a lot of people would probably say, eh, there's no difference, they mean the same, being happy. But for us that know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we know there is a difference. Every day, regardless of our circumstances, we experience the true meaning of joy as described in the Bible. Being merry is a wonderful feeling, but feeling merry is strictly an emotion, a temporary come and go emotion. We can be merry one minute, something can happen, and we can be totally devastated the next. But the joy we have in Jesus is never affected by our circumstances. Our joy is permanent. It's not just an emotion. We can feel joy, but it's more than a feeling. It's the deeply rooted condition of the heart. As a child, we learned the song, I have the joy, 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 joy down in my heart, down in my heart to stay. What a wonderful truth we learn as a child. Now as we relight the candles for hope and peace, we are reminded of the reason that we have joy in our salvation. It's because we have the hope, the hope of Christ's return and our eternal home with him. This is not just a wishful hope. It's the anticipation of something wonderful to come. And we have peace, the promise of peace on earth, but right now, the personal inner peace that passes all understanding. Because of Jesus, we have the blessed assurance of hope and peace, and this is the basis for our abundant joy. Today we'll be uh, continuing with the Christmas story found in uh, Luke chapter 2. Today I'll be reading uh, verses 8 through 14. Uh, Growing up, this, is, this has become my favorite uh, version of, of the Bible, the King James Version, and uh, it just seem, seems like it comes natural that that would be the one that, we, that you should read the Christmas story from. It's my favorite, and it's also Charlie Brown's favorite. Luke chapter 2, start with verse 8. And they were in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Let's go to prayer. O oh Lord our God, thanks. Thank you for sending Jesus to bring us salvation and restore our joy. We rejoice because we came, he came to live with us and in us and through us. May the good news of great joy of Jesus' coming be ever on our lips. Help us to be yours as we wait for you to come again. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Would you stand me as we begin worship with O Come, O Come, Emmanuel.
morning I read from Matthew's Gospel, not Linus or Charlie Brown's favorite <laughs> version of the story, but nevertheless, another version of the story, beginning in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man, and not wanting to disgrace her, desired to put her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For that which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. For it is he who will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph arose from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took her as his wife and kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Join me in prayer. Thank you so much, O oh God, for all of the details that we have to more than appreciate this great event that we celebrate at Christmas. We thank you for Luke's account and for Matthew's account and for Old Testament prophecies and for the rest of Scripture that helps us to be worshipers at this time. Lord, we want to be like those shepherds who came and, and bowed before the child. Lord, we pray that we would be this Christmas season like a child with that awe, that wonder, not regarding what this season means as all too familiar have heard it before, been there, and done that. Help us, Lord, to, to have fresh eyes and an open mind and a heart willing to receive once again the good news declared. We thank you so much for this worship service, for what has been planned, prepared. We thank you that we've already enjoyed the significance of the Advent wreath. We've already sung a familiar Christmas carol, and we thank you for more that will happen in this service. Opportunities for us to hear you, opportunities for you to change us. Make it so. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.
heard about in the scriptures. Can you hear me with this thing up here? Or can you hear me anyway? <laughs> well, I'm glad to see all of you here this morning. It's a beautiful day. I remember when I was seven years old. Anybody here seven years old? Wow. I heard a story about the uh, animals in the stable speaking. That was a long time ago. And I haven't heard that story since. But maybe what she was saying to us was that the animals were kind of excited about what was going on too. And the silent night could have very easily been called a noisy night. Can you imagine? They came into the stable ready to eat and there was a little boy child in the manger. You know what a manger is. It's a feeding trough. You're almost right. <laughs> Can you imagine what might have started then? All the cows mooing, all the horses neighing, donkeys braying, sheep buying around, and even <laughs> from duck in there that might be getting fattened up for a good celebration meal sometime. Did you happen to look at the insert here? All the names that Jesus has been called. The Good Shepherd. You suppose that's why the angels brought the message first to the shepherds. Could be. Shepherds weren't thought of very highly, but they had a lot of responsibility. And when the shepherds heard the angels singing and telling them about the good tidings of great joy, they went fairly hollering, if you will, into town. Do you know what I'm talking about when I say hollering? That was a way of spreading the news back in those days. Even when I was a kid and visited my grandparents in the country, I would hear people hollering, put their hands up to this way and holler the good news. I've got good news for you. And everybody heard it. There was not a, a silent night. Maybe Jesus wasn't crying. That part was silent. But all the noise in that stable and the shepherds spreading the good news, that was anything but a silent night. That was an exciting night. And it can be for us. If we remember that special night, that very special gift from God. Now, I was hoping that I'd find my friend Liam up here and ask him to pray for us. Is Liam back there somewhere hiding out? <laughs> Will, do you mind having a prayer for us? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you this morning day that you give us. And Lord, please help us to have a good day. And please help the preacher do a good job. Amen. Would you join me as we continue worship with angels we have heard on high and go tell it on the mountain. Please stand and sing.
Shall we pray? Father God, we, we come to you today grateful. Lord, you've given us so much. Your offerings to us are immeasurable. We come with air in our lungs. We come with clothing on our backs. You've surrounded us with a church family. God, we have so much to be thankful for. And at this time of year, Father God, we, we remember the beginning of your greatest gift to us, your best offering to us all. So Lord, we, we not only offer our money right now, Father God, we not only take this time to give you back our money, but Lord, we offer our very lives, the lives that your son, your offering saved. Father, do with this money and those lives as you would see fit. In the Father's holy and precious name, I ask these things. Amen.
Thank you, choir, and thank you, instrumentalists, and I hope that that encourages you, church, family, to come back this evening at 6 o'clock, prayerfully supporting them as well as expectant to hear the Lord speak to you through their hard work, the message that they will present in music, the wonderful message of Christmas. Pray for them and invite someone. American humorist George Aid insisted, there is everything in a name. A rose by any other name would smell as sweet, but would not cost half as much during the winter months. American writer Mark Twain quipped, names are not always what they seem. The common Welsh name spelled, and I hope this somehow is funny to at least one person in here, but you have, but you have had to somehow gone to Wales and, and seen the signs in Wales of names. They're this long, and they have no vowels, and I, I don't know how they pronounce any of it. So the American writer, Mark Twain, quipped, names are not always what they seem. The common Welsh name spelled B, Z, J, X, X, L, L, W, C, P is pronounced Jackson. Okay. In Matthew's Gospel, the first chapter, we see the naming of Jesus three times. Let's read again this text. Verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, desired to put her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bear a son. Here's the first naming. And you shall call his name Jesus. Perhaps you've heard how a Jew would pronounce it, Yeshua, or Yehoshua, the name Joshua, really. The name Jesus actually reflects not the Jewish spelling or Jewish pronunciation, but the Greek equivalent. In Greek, Jesus. In Hebrew, how he would have actually been called Yehoshua. That's Joshua. Notice how verse 21 concludes, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. Yehoshua, Joshua, Jesus literally means the Lord saves. So what you have in verse 21 following the name Jesus is actually an explanation of his name. For it is he who will save his people from their sins. The Lord saves. Verse 22. Now all this took place that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, that would be Isaiah, might be fulfilled, saying, verse 23, quotes Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son. And here's a second naming. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. 
Verse 24, and Joseph arose from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took her as his wife and kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son. And here's the third naming. And he called his name Jesus. What you see in verse 23, the name Emmanuel appears only three times in Scripture. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, which we have quoted by Matthew in chapter 1 and verse 23. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 8, and Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. It obviously is a special name, and God does not wear it out. Let's go back briefly. Isaiah chapters 7 and 8 chronicle a state of of emergency, a national crisis in Judah. Listen to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 1. Now it came about in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Abram, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to wage war against it but could not conquer it. Y'all, Judah had won a battle according to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 1, but it could not win the war. They'd won a battle, but they could not win the war. Listen to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 2. When it was reported to the house of David, that would be the kingdom of Judah, saying, the Arameans have camped in Ephraim, his heart, that would be the heart of the king Ahaz, and the hearts of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake with the wind. Resistance for little Judah would have been futile. Isaiah chapter 7, beginning in verse 3. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, go out now to meet Ahaz, that's the king, you and your son, Chiar Yashub, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field and say to him, take care and be calm. Have no fear and do not be faint hearted because of these two stubs of smoldering firebrands on account of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and the son of Remaliah. Because Aram with Ephraim and the son of Remaliah has planned evil against you, saying, let us go up against Judah and terrorize it and make for ourselves a breach in its walls and set up the son of Tabeel as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. Isaiah chapter 7, beginning in verse 10. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask for a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep as Sheol, or high as heaven. But Ahaz, I'm interjecting, a wicked king, said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, listen now, O house of David, is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men that you will try the patience of my God as well? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. For before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. I know you might be struggling trying to figure out what in the world is happening here. National crisis for little Judah. That's the southern tribe. They have two enemies camped against them. Not just the northern tribes, but also the Syrians, or known as the Arameans. 
The wicked king Ahaz, who has no faith in God, who's been worshiping false gods and promoting the worship of false gods, is panicked. Of course he would be, because he doesn't trust God. And in spite of his lack of trust, God being faithful to his people, through the prophet Isaiah, announces good news. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Emmanuel was a promise. God with us. Yes, the announcement here is that Ahaz understands God would defeat his two enemies on the northern border. He wouldn't have won by himself. But God's intervening. And God would defeat these two enemies. Ironically, using Assyria. Now that can be confusing because the Arameans who have camped against little Judah, are also known as the Syrians. You have also Assyrians. So they're even further to the north and further to the east, but we won't be confused by Assyria because we all know the story of Jonah. Remember the story of Jonah? He didn't want to go where? Nineveh. What's Nineveh? That's the capital of the Assyrians. So God says through the prophet Isaiah, to wicked Ahaz, in spite of his lack of faith, I will defeat these two enemies on your northern border during this state of emergency. And God ironically will use the Assyrians, and the Assyrians happen to be a pagan ally and Ahaz's primary trust. Now that should not have been. Whom should Ahaz have trusted? God. Oh, he's not, he's not going to God. He doesn't believe in God. He thinks through diplomacy, if I've got two enemies, I've got to pay somebody bigger and meaner to come help me. And God says, fine. You want to trust the Assyrians? All right, I'll use the Assyrians. I'll use them and they'll come. Listen now to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 17 through 19. The Lord will bring on you, on your people, and on your father's house such days as have never come since the day that Ephraim separated from Judah, the king of Assyria. And it will come about in that day that the Lord will whistle for the fly that is in the remotest part of the rivers of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria, and they will all come and settle on the steep ravines, on the ledges of the cliffs, on all the thorn bushes, and all the watering places. So y'all, the, the promise, Emmanuel, was rescue. Good words for a people under attack. Rescue, how Emmanuel first appears in scripture, a promise of rescue. Listen to this well-known verse. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For what? Thou art with me. What is that? That's Emmanuel. God with us. When? Where? In the worst circumstances, right? He's not just with us on the mountaintop or in the worship service. He's with us where we need him always. Yea, though I walk to the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Yes, the first time that we see Emmanuel in chapter 7 of Isaiah, verse 14, and then chapter 8 of Isaiah, verse 8, we see that it's a promise of rescue during a state of emergency. The Assyrians would help, but they'd also hurt. The price that the wicked king Ahaz must pay, the consequences for not trusting God, but trusting pagans. So finally, I will read 
Isaiah chapter 8, verses 5 through 10. And again, the Lord spoke to me. This is Isaiah writing, further saying, Inasmuch as these people have rejected the gently flowing waters of Shiloh and rejoice in resin and the son of Remaliah, now therefore, behold, the Lord is about to bring on them the strong and abundant waters of the Euphrates, even the king of Assyria and all his glory. And it will rise up over all its channels and go over all its banks. Then it will sweep on into Judah. It will overflow and pass through. It will reach even to the neck and the spread of its wings will fill the breath of your land. O Emmanuel. That's the second time Emmanuel appears in Scripture. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 8. Be broken, O peoples, and be shattered, and give ear all remote places of the earth. Gird yourselves, yet be shattered. Gird yourselves, yet be shattered. Devise a plan, but it will be thwarted. State a proposal, but it will not stand. For God is with us. Assyria would help and hurt. Now... With that in the backdrop, we come to Matthew's Gospel. Matthew chapter 1, church, profiles a climactic state of expectancy. That contrasts Isaiah chapter 7 and 8, which is a state of emergency. Now we see a climactic state of expectancy. Aptly, the Methodist Charles Wesley penned these words, Come thou long-expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our fears and sins release us. Let us find our rest in thee. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth thou art, Dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart. Consider this expectancy when the Apostle Paul in Galatians, Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5 wrote, but when the fullness, I love that description, the fullness of time came. What does that mean? There's an expectancy, yes. Yes. And God's people had been wondering, when? Surely sooner, now. But I'm so thankful that nobody, not a people, not an individual, not a church, can force God to do anything ahead of schedule. He's never early, he's never late, always on time. So when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, Paul wrote, born of a woman, born under the law, in order that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. I talked about Isaiah, chapter 7 and 8. Emmanuel was a promise, a promise of rescue. In Matthew chapter 1, Emmanuel was a plan, God with us. Would you consider that just for a moment? Okay, there's, there's two parts to this. God, name or subject, with us, that's the preposition. Let's think about it first of all. Let's focus on the God part, God with us. Not a religion or a new philosophy. Not an angel or another prophet, not an edict decreed from heaven, not one more book to read. Hey, Baptists, not another committee <laughs> or some sort of council. No, God with us. Now let's focus on the second part, God with us. More than the high priest, not just the religious leadership, not just the Jews, more than the wise and the wealthy, more than the popular and the powerful, no restricted access. 
God with us, that's a first person plural. It's, it's not qualified in any way. God with us. You could say all of us. Listen to the writer of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Y'all, this plan, according to Matthew's gospel, this plan, Emmanuel, was redemption. Yes, it's a name, and it represents a person, but it's also the name of a plan. Kind of like, and, and you have to be old enough to remember this, those of us who are old enough to remember the words, desert shield. Do you know those words? I think you do. A war that was televised from the very beginning. You could have watched it on CNN in 1991, January. And when we who are old enough hear that, we understand, oh, that was a military exercise to liberate little Kuwait who had been invaded by Iraq. Desert Shield was a plan. Here we see in Matthew chapter 1 that Emmanuel was even better as a plan, and it was a plan of redemption. Y'all, this plan, it was a plan with difficulties. It was. Oh, man. I mean, this involves Jesus, right? The eternal Son of God becoming the son of Mary and Joseph. What an assignment. When did he get this assignment? Well, according to the New Testament, this assignment had been given to the Son of God before the creation of the heavens and the earth. Before there ever was an Adam and Eve, before the first sin ever occurred, a conversation takes place in eternity past between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And the Son agreed. This boggles our mind. But it's truth. The Son agreed to become the Son of Mary and Joseph, to be our perfect sacrifice, our substitute, to address the mess called sin, and to take care of it for good. But this was no easy plan. And I hope we appreciate how difficult this plan was. A plan with difficulties, yes. Consider four difficulties associated with this plan. First difficulty, the virgin birth. I'm back in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Was Joseph excited about this? No. Look at verse 19. And Joseph, her husband being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, desired to put her away secretly. You know, to materialize as an adult would have been a whole lot easier for Jesus. Would have been. Of course, there would not have been the pregnancy and, and, and only ladies can understand the, the stress of a pregnancy. Uh, there, there would not have been the execution of the, the boys in and around Bethlehem. Uh, if he just had come as an adult, there would not have been any situation, you know, with, with Joseph here as, as, as he's, he, he's not happy about this. But he's a good man, but he's not happy about this. Think about it, y'all. And, and you have to be careful. One time I was, I, I was mentioning this at a Baptist church, and I think someone who was of Catholic background came up and was not happy about me talking about Mary. I have high regard for Mary, but she's just a person. A wonderful person, favorite of God. But we Baptists don't pray to Mary. We don't worship Mary. So 
I'm making the following statement, and it might upset some of you, but it's the truth. Mary, single and pregnant, appeared, I'm not saying she was, appeared to those who didn't know, appeared immoral. What would we have thought? Oh, you know, there's always the option of the Holy Spirit conceiving someone, right? Is that it? Really? That had never happened before. And it's only happened one time. So here she is, single and pregnant in a culture that regarded sexual misconduct as a capital offense. Death by stoning. That's the law. Go back to the law of Moses. Or go fast forward to John chapter 7, verse 53 to chapter 8, verse 11. Do you remember the woman caught in adultery? What did they want to do with her? Stone her. You could also go to Mark's gospel, chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. I'm not going there for the sake of time. How interesting. When the folks in the synagogue at Nazareth refer to Jesus, it's actually a slur. They say, oh, the carpenter, the son of whom? Mary. They don't call him the son of Joseph. They actually regard him as illegitimate. Y'all... Yes, the virgin birth is true. Absolutely, Mary is, is upright and righteous. But those who didn't understand thought something else. Second difficulty, Herod the Great. Dealing with him and his son Archelaus. I'm going to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard it, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he began to inquire of them where the Christ was to be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and ascertained from them the time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make careful search for the child. And when you have found him, report to me that I too may come and worship him. Verse 11. And they came into the house and saw the child with Mary his mother, and they came down and worshiped him. Opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed for their own country by another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. And he arose and took the child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt and was there until the death of Herod that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Out of Egypt did I call my son. Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its environs from two years old and under according to the time which he had ascertained from the Magi. Verse 22 and 23. But when he heard, talking about Joseph, though Herod was dead, that Archelaus, the son, was reigning over Judah in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there and being warned by God in a dream, he departed for the regions of Galilee and came and resided in a city called Nazareth, that what was spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He shall be called a Nazarene. You all, the third difficulty of this plan of redemption was human 
limitations, and every one of us can appreciate those. Hey, we're all human. And what are those human limitations? Weakness and vulnerability. Listen to just one verse. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Finally, the fourth difficulty of this plan was not just being born, but the fourth difficulty was death and resurrection. Tertullian, maybe you've heard that name, maybe not. A Latin church father who lived in the third century asserted, talking about this plan, it is incredible because it is foolish. He was buried and rose again. It is certain because it is impossible. I tell you, a plan with difficulties, yes, but without defeat. When God has a plan, it happens. It might seem unlikely in the moment. The clouds might be thick, and it seems that the light's growing dim, but I'm telling you, when God has a plan, you cannot stop it. God's in charge. A plan with difficulties, but without defeat. Matthew chapters 1 and 2 record five dreams. Five. Chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. Chapter 2, verse 12. Chapter 2, verse 13. Chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. And chapter 2, verse 22. Five dreams in these two chapters. Each dream was an adjustment, divine intervention for the sake of the plan. Dream followed difficulty. And difficulty followed Jesus throughout his ministry. And you know that. Let's just, as we conclude today, use Matthew's gospel, just Matthew's gospel, as a historical record of the difficulties that our Lord Jesus encountered. Not just once, not just occasionally, but throughout his ministry, throughout his life. I'm just mentioning them, not reading any of these scriptures. Chapter 4 of Matthew's Gospel, temptations, plural, by the devil in the wilderness. Chapter 8, two confrontations with demons. No commitment despite his passionate appeal to the folks listening. No commitment to his words. Follow me. His own disciples in chapter 8 exhibit a lack of faith. And the region where he was rejects him. Chapter 9. Criticism from the scribes. Criticism from the Pharisees. Criticism from the disciples of John the Baptist. A crowd, according to chapter 9, ridicules Jesus. Another confrontation with a demon. And then the defamation of his character by none other than the Pharisees. Chapter 11. John the Baptist loses faith in Jesus. No repentance among all the towns around the Sea of Galilee, even though they had seen miracle after miracle after miracle of Jesus. Chapter 12, criticism from the Pharisees, his first death threat, forcing Jesus to withdraw. Another confrontation with a demon. Once again, the Pharisees defame his character. And then to top it off in chapter 12, Sign seekers, how frustrating. The Pharisees and the Sadducees. Chapter 13, rejection by his hometown of Nazareth. Chapter 14, no faith exhibited by Peter. Really? Peter, the leader of the group. Chapter 15, criticism from the Pharisees and the scribes. And his disciples, though they've been with him for this long, still 
lack understanding in a word, ignorant. Chapter 16, sign seekers once again, and this time the Pharisees and the Sadducees test him publicly in order to embarrass Jesus. The disciples, once again, exhibit no faith. And if you remember at Caesarea Philippi, Peter takes Jesus aside and rebukes him. Chapter 17, another confrontation with a demon. Once again, the disciples exhibit no faith. And even those that he reached, that nobody else would, the tax collectors complained about Jesus. Chapter 18, dissension among the disciples. Chapter 19, another test to publicly embarrass him, this time administered by the Pharisees. Chapter 20, more dissension among the disciples. Chapter 21, confrontation with the money changers at the temple. Criticism from the chief priests and scribes. Challenge from the chief priests and elders. And an arrest attempt by the chief priests and the Pharisees. Chapter 22, four more uh, public tests of Jesus to embarrass him, administered by the Pharisees, the Herodians, and the Sadducees. Chapter 26, death threat, his second. The disciples criticize Jesus. Judas betrays him. In the Garden of Gethsemane, no prayer support from the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. Then the arrest, and then he sees all of his disciples desert him. He's on trial before the high priest, Caiaphas, and during the trial, spit upon, ridiculed, and beaten. And to top it off, Peter denies him three times. Chapter 27. The trial continues with Caiaphas. Then he stands trial before Pilate. He will be scourged and additionally spit upon, beaten, and ridiculed. The nation rejects him when they say, we want Barabbas, crucify him. And while he's dying, he still has no peace as the very folks enjoying the spectacle ridicule him as he agonizes on the cross. Well, chapter 28 is a great chapter, right? That's the last chapter. When he resurrects and he appears to his disciples on a high mountain, you know what it says in Matthew chapter 28, verse 17? Some of those disciples doubted then. Doubted then. I'm thankful that difficulties, as we've documented them quickly, could not distract, let alone subdue Jesus. Listen to Luke chapter 9, verse 51. And it came about when the days were approaching for his ascension that he resolutely, here's where I do love the King James, where it says that he set his face like a flint to go to Jerusalem. Oh, he could not be distracted. He could not be detoured. He knew why he had come. And the plan was more important about our redemption than his comfort. This plan required Calvary. It did. But you know what? He's not defeated, though he's nailed on a cross. Because on the cross, what does he declare? It, not I. It is finished. And this plan also specified what had never happened before, someone coming back from the dead, resurrection. On the third day after Calvary, he arose victorious. This is the whole story of the gospel. Wrapped in swaddling clothes and placed in a feeding trough. You can't separate it all. Here's the conclusion. By the way, Matthew's gospel is my favorite. If I had to pick one, I love Matthew's gospel. May not be yours. You might like John or you may like Luke. My favorite is Matthew. And I find this to be fascinating. Pointed out by a New Testament scholar named George Eldon Ladd. In chapter 1, what do we have? 
Matthew, the gospel writer, introduces us to Emmanuel. You know what Emmanuel means, God with us. In the last chapter, what does Emmanuel do? Here's what he says, lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth. We're introduced to God with us, chapter one, and God with us tells us, I'm with you. This beautiful gospel is wrapped together tight, chapter one and chapter 28, by this one truth, he's with us. He's with us. May I say, if you have faith about this crazy plan, And I mean that not disrespectful, because this is, who would have thought of this plan? Virgin birth, death on a cross, rising again. If you have that much faith in this plan, and you ought, don't you think, church family, that God can take care of the other little details of your life? And they're not little to you, I understand. They're big deals. Everything you face, if it's a need, if it's a hurt, if it's a crisis, if it's a problem, if it's a conflict, is a big deal in your life. I understand that. But you know what? It's a little detail compared to the plan. If you can believe that he can get you out of death and into eternal life, out of hell, having abundant life and on the way to heaven. Don't you think he can handle the electric bill? Don't you think he can take care of the shoulder injury? Don't you think he could feed your hungry stomach? And I know you're really hungry right now. Don't you think he can take care of that family situation? I'm telling you, this plan, we call it the will of God, Paul says, is perfect and acceptable and good. And you know what? It's big enough to include you. And if it is, God's plan, it will happen. You can count on it. In other words, you have no reason to worry, church. You have every reason to pray and to praise. Because if you're part of his plan, and you are, his plan always happens and it's good and acceptable and it's perfect he's with you for some of us here this is a tough time absolutely we understand that loved one whether it's a parent whether it's a spouse whether it's a child is gone and you more than ever feel that loss Does that mean you have no faith? No, that means you really love that person who's not here. And yes, you find comfort in the fact that that loved one is with Jesus. But here's the other comfort for you from this message. He's with you. God's with you. So as you you cry, as you remember, understand you're not alone. God is with you. That's Emmanuel. So no matter how dark the day, no matter how thick the clouds, no matter how low the valley, God is with you. And through your tears, you can still sing. Hold on to him as he holds on to you. Praise God for Emmanuel. Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful for the hope that we have. And as we understood with the lighting of the candle, as our wonderful sister in Christ, Gail, said, it is not just wishful hope, it's real hope. And it's hope, capital H, a person, Christ in us. We thank you for the good news. It's so good. We've got to tell it. We have to act upon it to show that it makes a difference in our life, and it does. It sure does. Help us.
to be the lights of the world, as Jesus said, to go out into the darkness where there's lots of hurt and heartbreak, despair, and worse. Help us to show that there's hope. Light. Life. Something much better than business as usual. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Simple question. Do you know him? If not, today can be the opportunity for you to have a personal relationship with Emmanuel. Would you give Clint, would you give me the opportunity to explain to you this wonderful relationship? And this church family, though they're hungry, because the preacher has preached over time, 1202, right? They're willing to wait if you're willing to say yes to Jesus. You're among friendly folk here. If there's a need in your life, if you, if you are a Christian, but you need some prayer, you can pray right where you are because he's with you right where you are. You can come to the altar and pray, or you can pray with Clint or with me. We'd love to do that too. Whatever your decision you do as God leads.